Welcome to Welcome to the Hollowell Manor. I'm Max. And I'm Tina. And we are in season two. Andy is dead. Wow. I mean, I was getting ready to go woo that we were on season two, and then, like, you had to make it sound like I was wooing Andy's death. Okay, on a scale from one to ten, how much do you actually care that Andy is dead? I mean, I don't. I. Whatever. He was cool for the first, like, three episodes maybe so in general on television you have these characters that slow down the protagonist so that you can have a long-running tv show yes but people tend to hate them because they don't want their protagonist that they're identifying with slowed down i mean no one likes a character who is purely an obstacle and, I mean, that's the problem with uh, Skylar on Breaking Bad. Even though she is right. <laughs> like, objectively, she is correct. But people just want to see the plot. So they take it out on Skylar. Also, there's probably some misogyny mixed in there. Mm. Uh, my example was going to be uh, Connor Angel, but he might just be plain annoying. And no, Connor's just annoying. But it's the deal with Andy, right? He only exists to slow down Prue. And it's especially annoying because on these TV shows... That character, the uh, the cop friend character, mm -hmm. usually exists to help the character do things that they wouldn't have access to, like background checks or run that plate or all of that kind of stuff. You mean the stuff we're going to use Daryl for later in the show. Exactly. What I'm saying is the stuff that Andy, that pop culture has set us up to believe Andy should assist with, in fact, he hindered. Mm. And that makes him a character that is just not likable. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about the problem with the fact that pop culture trains us to expect the cop friend to help you get around the law, but that's like, that's for a different podcast. A whole different kettle of fish. My thing is, he kind of stopped Prue from having plots in general. Like, I mean, I guess she had the auction stuff, but generally most of her plots revolved around her relationship with Andy and what it was that week. Isn't that the truth, right? The love interest character came in... And all of a sudden, her plots were all about the romance and not about, like, all of the cool stuff she does on her own. I was gonna say, it's good that he's gone because now we can get that, except I don't think we ever really get that with Prue. Well, you've mentioned before that Prue started off as the main character, our, our point of view character, but that really shifts, and it's especially clear in this episode, because one of the main continuing plots that happens in this episode is Piper establishing p3 hmm. because now piper is our main character yeah i think piper is the main character for season two and i think that phoebe is the main character for season three granted it has been a while since i've watched all of charmed but i think season three is when the cole stuff starts i could have looked this up but i chose not to i wanted us to go into charmed well i wanted me to go into charmed with no knowledge of the show outside of that one five-year period i watched it obsessively Okay, I think that's fair. That's fair. So, like, uh, I, I think Cole is a season three thing, and that's when it becomes Phoebe's. I feel like the show, for the rest of its run, is going to go back and forth between whether Piper or Phoebe is the main character. Oh, yeah. And Paige never gets to be the main character, if I remember right. But, I mean... I mean, obviously it's an ensemble cast. It's power of three. But, you know, not really. Yeah. Phoebe, I don't know if Phoebe's the better main character because she has plots outside of her family, because Piper gets the really strong Leo plot, but then that kind of just carries through to the rest of the show, and it's all about Leo until it's about her kids, and, and, and you know, Prue never gets to do anything again until she dies, and then Paige basically never gets to do anything. Like, remember when she was the headmaster of magic school for a good 15 minutes? God, we really thought magic school was going to be a thing. I actually have um, a charmed spinoff comic about magic school that I should do a little thing about. Is it like a mid -call or something? Because I thought magic school got taken over by demons in the last season. Yeah, it's a mid -call. Oh, right. In the, in the final episode, they established that they retake magic school. It, it, it never made sense that magic, magic school got taken over by demons in the first place. It had those mystical barriers. 
I think the problem with magic school is that it's a thing that from a world building sense makes a lot of sense. It should be there. It should exist. Obviously, witches would have put this in place. Mm -hmm. But so many problems would have been solved early on if they had had magic school. So it had to be like, wait, where did this come from? (laughs) Where where was this when uh, the girls were getting their powers locked away? Yeah. Yeah. This would have been a good thing for Leo to bring up when they're dealing with that pyrokinetic kid. Yeah, the problem with magic school is that it solves too many problems. And before people are like, oh, it was just a Harry Potter ripoff, it was. Yeah, we know. (laughs) Yes. But the thing is, it's not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination. Like, there have been magic school books since time began. I mean, you're you're reading... um, Wizard of Versity. Yeah, Wizard of Versity has a magic school in it. Yeah. And there's... Oh, God, there's this book I read... I don't remember the name of it, but there was this book I read uh, when Harry Potter was first becoming, like, a big thing. Because there was a a thing at Barnes & Noble where it was like, if you like Harry Potter, you might like these books. And it was, like, this British kids' book from, like, the 70s or 80s. And I was like, wow, J.K. Rowling definitely read this because large swaths of it were, like, taken, like... Well... Because it was also about, you know, a magic school that the main character goes to this magic school and you know he has uh, two best friends a smart girl and a kind of slacker boy with red hair and it's like there's a lot of stuff where i'm like mm, okay well uh i'm also reading the alana books to sam right now mm-hmm. and those books are about a night school but we know that her twin brother is off at magic school and in fact magic is an elective at night school yeah like Night, K-N-I, G-H-T. So, yes, in the case of Charmed, this was definitely a Harry Potter riff, but that doesn't make it any less legitimate. This sort of thing is like a standby of, I want to say British children's literature, but I guess just kids lit in general. Well, the school novel is a British classic. Yeah. So it's just a small step to make that a magic school. Yeah. So this episode is episode one of season two, Witch Trial. It's a real first episode of season two episode. Oh, so I'm so glad you said that. Okay. Uh, this episode was uh, directed by Craig Zisk, who did Out of Sight, and then he's going to go on and do a bunch more that we're going to talk about. Ms. Hellfire. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but this episode was written by Brad Kern. And as I was watching it, knowing about the tension between Constance and Burge and Brad Kern, I was thinking how interesting it is that season two opens, Brad Kern takes the reins, writing, writing-wise, and the, the episode is about a demon undoing season one. Huh. That's an interesting bit of meta-narrative there. I'm just saying it's a little on the nose, Brad Kern. Plus, we get introduced to Neighbor Dan. We do get introduced to Neighbor Dan. Also, just like a fun bit of... And Jenny. Neighbor Jenny. God. Yes. A.K.A. Uh, Dawn Light. That's... She, you know what? It's fine. She's fine. You like Dawn. I do like Dawn, but I don't think you can say Dawn Light in a nice way, no matter how much the person you're talking to likes Dawn. Well, she, she's like uh, Seltzer Dawn. Meanwhile, a fun bit of uh, convergence. This episode takes place on the autumnal equinox, mm-hmm. which this year is happening on Tuesday. Oh, neat. So I assumed this was a Constance M. Burge one because of the stuff with the equinox. This is, this is a lot witchier than I tend to uh, think of. Yeah, Brad, uh, I... I wish that your facial expression could carry over to podcasting. This is witchier than I tend to think of Brad Kern episodes. Okay, when we get to the witchy scenes, I have some notes about how these are obviously Brad Kern and not Constance and Burge scenes. Oh, right, the nudity. No, no, that's... um, No, no, not that. (laughs) Not, not... Hey, everyone. All Hey, all of you attractive women in your mid-twenties, let's all get sky-clad and thrust our breasts upon Alyssa Milano. I mean... 
yes, that's obviously a Brad Kern thing, but that, that wasn't <laughs> the thing I was talking about. Uh, should we get started? Yes. Also, it kind of honks me off that they're like, Phoebe's interested in getting into actual witch stuff, and then that just never gets followed up on. They do the same thing with Paige! So the episode opens with Phoebe entering the house in the dark, only to find Piper making time with some dude on the couch. Uh-oh. And then, okay, and then Piper is so embarrassed by Phoebe walking in, but also Phoebe saying, hello, sister witch, when she walks in, that she freezes the guy, whose name is Rob. And, it's, Piper, you can't freeze a guy every time something gets awkward emotionally. That's, use your words, Piper. You think that the guys who date Piper who don't know about her whole freezing thing think that they're, like, getting brain damage? Because, like... Because she, she, like, they have these, like, time jumps where she just, like, skips around. Yeah, like, imagine you're with... Every time you're with your girlfriend, there are these little beats where suddenly she's in a slightly different location. Like, I'm not sure how much change blindness would cover there. Yeah, I... And maybe that's why the only relationship she has that lasts is, uh, is Leo. Because every other guy she's with senses, even if they don't sense it consciously, they sense that something's off. Mm. So, Prue comes in and Phoebe's like, you have to leave. Piper froze a guy, so we, you know, we have to do the thing where everyone resets so that, you know, he doesn't know that we're witches or think that he's having some sort of episode. And maybe Piper should just stop freezing guys? But yeah, so Prue steps outside... Piper unfreezes, and then Prue comes back in. I know I've talked about this before, but I think that Piper getting the honestly kind of show-breaking exploding power is because she uses her powers more than the other sisters. Oh, like from a like a, an in-story reason that she gets a strong power. Yeah, because she's exercising her power so much more than the others. That makes total sense. Okay, so we don't talk a lot about the terrible outfits that the girls wear, because then that's just what this podcast would be. Mm. It would just be the Look at This Terrible Outfit podcast. But, but oh my uh, god. Prue is wearing a neon green knit tube top with, like, her white bra showing underneath. What? Who did she honk <laughs> off? <laughs> Who in the costuming department was like... Screw you, <laughs> Shannon Doherty. Knit neon green halter top. White bra. It's, it's a tube top. It has no tube, straps. Tube top. Okay, yeah, the, that's that's a bra. I, for a second, I thought it had, like, elastic things just... Like, yeah, no, no, that's her bra showing underneath. It's not just elastic that's clipped to the front and back so it doesn't fall off her. Oh, I mean, they probably put that bra on her so that they could clip the top to the bra. Hmm. Also, it's not, it doesn't fit her body well, which is, in my opinion, a uh, a key sign that you pissed off the costuming department. Like, Alyssa it, Milano looks great. <laughs> Alyssa Milano looks great this whole episode, by the way. Mm. Even though she has these weird braids that she puts, she puts these weird braids in her hair to like, it's go to the, yeah, to go to the Wiccan ceremony. And then she leaves them in all episode and they're just, they look like the kind of thing I did when I was experimenting with my hair when I was 12. Yeah. So Piper shoes the guy away, apparently unaware that there are places in the house that they can make out that aren't the living room. It's a pretty big house. Well, I, I think she's a little embarrassed to be caught by her sisters with this guy, because this guy is her loan officer! Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like someone should probably be getting fired here. Just, you know, it doesn't seem like the moral thing right there. So, they... So Piper and Prue start heading off to other parts of the house, uh, Piper, to prepare for further encounters with the loan officer. I was going to say dates, but they're also kind of business related. Yeah, they're so. meeting up at P3 the next day so that, or, or the, the possible future site of P3. She's trying to get a loan to buy it. Yes. And Prue is getting ready for more auction stuff because that's still going on. And Phoebe's all... Hey, but don't you know what tomorrow is? And her sisters are like, no. And she's like, it's, it's, it's the fall equinox, one of the most powerful Wiccan days of the year. Which also falls on the anniversary of the day that they got their witch powers. Which makes sense, because they established it was like 
I mean, I, I think it was supposed to be powerful because all the planets were in convergence or something, but it makes sense. And plus, it's a good way for us to know that exactly one year has passed. Now, Phoebe's going to meet up with some Wiccan friends that she met at the Wiccan bookstore. Oh, when do you have... Since when do you have friends, Phoebe? Well, I mean, she had to go to the bookstore and meet friends. Mm. Now, I... Okay, this is, this is a Brad versus Constance thing. She clarifies that these are normal witches not magic witches like they are Mm. and the idea remember in the first episode wiccans had powers like being a witch gave you powers it's just that the charmed ones were really powerful yeah like brad kern is erasing that people who follow the wiccan religion according to brad kern don't have powers the charmed ones have powers demons have powers but normal humans can't do ritual magic okay this is a weird thing later because later in the show in the episode where daryl officially finds out that they're witches there's a guy who's going around and he needs to kill 13 witches to something ceremony blah 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 and one of the like one of the women that they need to protect is a wiccan Mm -hmm. and piper's sick of her dancing around the house in bare feet and waving sage around so she freezes her which shouldn't work. Because she's a witch! Yeah. But, like, apparently she's enough of a witch for her to count for the ritual, but good witches don't freeze, as we know from Aviva. Although, we can't get into the whole Aviva thing again, because... God, they should have brought back Aviva. I, I'm... Yeah. Brett, so... She was clearly a real witch. That's why the freezing didn't work on her. Season one was establishing that Wiccans are witches. Yes. Brad Kern is erasing that. Brad Kern is saying this is not grounded in any real world mysticism. Witches are imaginary fantasy creatures and that's all that counts. Yeah, being a witch is like a genetic thing that gives you power. It's basically, it's being a mutant. Because of that, because he's doing that here, I feel like this episode kind of rewrites what the show is more than anything else. I mean, we did have a little bit of this in the episode with uh, Max the psychokinetic kid Uh uh-huh like we had a little bit of that because his we knew his mom was a witch and he got his powers from her so yeah i guess i might just feel like it's stronger here because this is you know season two first episode so it's kind of it gets a chance to establish things again and also that's one of the things that's frustrating about charmed is that at least early on, they have a bunch of really strong single episode characters that really should be reoccurring characters. The show suffers from not really having a good supporting cast. I mean, outside of love interests and Daryl, there's basically nobody. Which is a shame. It would be so great if there was, like, a Wiccan community that they depended on. Yeah. I, I It's just... Hell, I would watch... I would watch the hell out of an Aviva and Max spinoff. I just... I want the alternate universe where there was no Brad Kern and Constance and Burge maintained a strong control over the show for its whole run. I want to see what that show looked like. Yeah. So they go upstairs to look at the Book of Shadows because they're like, you know, I can't believe it's been a whole year. Let's see what's going on with the Book of Shadows because it's doing that thing it does sometimes where it just flips to a random page. I was thinking that Phoebe runs into the room because she hears the book turning to a page and it's like, you heard that from downstairs? ace hearing phoebe so it's turning to a page that is about the rite of passage which i have to tell you is worded unnecessarily confusingly like it makes me mad there's no reason to word it that way unless you want to cause confusion yeah whoever put that passage into the book was a dick yeah it says that they're going to need the power of one but don't you know, it's three acting as one. That's annoying. That's called the power of three. Like, that's, that's the power of three means the power of three working as one. Calling it the power of one is just, is just there to throw them off. It's, that's not a twist. That's just you <laughs> lied to us. Yes. So they have time to like look at the page for about a second before a portal opens up. And a demon with effort uh, grabs the book. Okay, yes. This demon looks great. 
the makeup is great. He's got giant horns. It's not just a human that we're going to call a demon. But. But. This demon, we will learn, is working from the astral plane. That's why he's able to steal the book. Because, you know, only a charmed one can take the book out of the manor. Hmm. But he doesn't actually leave the manor. He's on the astral plane. I re- yeah. This is never consistent throughout the show, but... I remember it being a thing that evil can't touch the book, except I guess the shapeshifters did that one time and they just couldn't take it out of the house. Sometimes evil can't touch it. Sometimes evil can touch it, but they can't take it out of the house. I mean, I think the most consistent thing is that only the sisters can take it out of the house. That's pretty consistent. Yeah. Uh, but because this guy is... This guy? This guy! No, because this demon, Abraxas, is on the astral plane... Awesome name, by the way. Because he's on the astral plane, he interacts with the sister through like an astral window opening up Hmm. and that effect looks super cheap like the 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 superposition of this window with a demon in it over the scene that we're watching it's like it i feel like we could do that in after effects ourselves right now honestly this might just be because it's an older show but i know these special effects will get better and then much, much worse. I feel like a lot of this stuff could be, you know, very easily done in After Effects these days. I mean, it, it, it's not fair to say that. It's, it's 20 years later. Of course we can do on our home computers what they were doing in the studio 20 years later. It's not fair of me, but it looks terrible. It does. <laughs> Although, weirdly enough, these special effects and Charmed, as, as I just said, they will get worse at a certain point. Yeah, well, I mean... At some point, I think they just decided that it, it wasn't worth spending the money on. That's not what people cared about. Yes. Which, fair, I guess. So the demon grabs the book, and Phoebe's like, Prue, use your power to get the book back. And Prue puts her hand up, and then she's like, oh, looks at it, and she's like, what? And the demon's like, <laughs> and closes the window. Prue doesn't want to use her powers because she's still messed up about Andy dying. So she's like... She's, like, gun-shy about using her powers. Way to make that everyone else's problem, Prue. <laughs> so mean. It's valid. Okay, so we get the credits, and neighbor effing Dan is in the credits already. Uh, so is neighbor Jenny. Yeah, yeah, and neighbor Jenny, which I would be so honked off if I was, like, Brian Krause. I know he's not in this episode, but... You know how long it took him to get into the opening credits of Charmed? Forever? Yeah. And, like, Neighbor Jenny never does anything. I guess Neighbor Dan does some stuff, but... Neighbor Dan being in the opening credits makes sense. Neighbor Jenny is weird. I I mean, clearly they intended for her to do more in the show than they ended up having her do. I, I went to her IMDb page yesterday just to kind of see what her deal was what she was doing Mm -hmm. and it was one of those imdb pages that was clearly written by the person and it had a little note that was like she's currently taking a break from acting which is that's fine that's good whatever but i was like it was it, it was like the uh the imdb equivalent of when you announce on social media that you're taking a break from social media So when we come back from credits, the girls are still in the attic, cleaning up after the the demon thing. Yeah, it had a lot of... Apparently opening an astral window makes a lot of wind. A lot of astral wind. Or... Yeah, there's like it's, like... it's like opening a window into space, you know? There's... It's gonna be a... It's gonna be a bit of a pressure system or whatever. Ass wind, if you will. I will not. <laughs> so... Boy, they spent a lot of time cleaning the attic, which I think is a nice touch. Yeah. Later, that's basically all Leo ends up doing. (laughs) So Piper and Phoebe are telling Prue that clearly she's the one who has to defeat the demon because the power of one must be referring to her because, because as everyone agrees, hers is the most powerful power. Okay, okay. Phoebe's like, all the demons and warlocks we face say that your power is the strongest. No, Phoebe, if I recall correctly, everyone says your power is the strongest. Every person who talks about the different levels of power of the powers says that prophecy is the most powerful power. Which is BS because it's clearly the time freezing. 
Actually, I think prophecy probably is the most powerful power. It's just that it's not active, so you don't notice it. Yeah. Although, I think it reflects badly on them that Prue moves objects with her mind, Piper freezes time, and Phoebe kicks people, and they're all generally portrayed as the same level of, you know, effective. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I mean, Piper's powers get aggressively broken later. Phoebe's, well, when she gets the empathy thing... Her secondary power is basically just kicking, but more. Well, okay, so her secondary power, which she will then lose, where she gets the ability to fly, Mm -hmm. or levitate, I guess. Yeah. It's shown as helping her fight because she'll, like, levitate and then kick someone in the face. And I'm just... Is she Danielson? I'm just watching... Yes, thank you. I'm just watching her going... You don't have any... You're... You don't have any grounding. You're, you're going to kick, and then you're, you're just going to fly backwards. I mean, it's magic, so I guess it doesn't work like that, but it really bugs me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Levitating should make your kicks less powerful, not more. They talk about Prue as having, like... Prue, uh, we've discussed this before. Phoebe has a preventative power. Uh, Piper has a defensive power. Prue has an offensive power. Except Prue's power is also kind of just used defensively. Like, she uses it to throw people backwards. It It's not really a finisher power. I mean, it's, I guess it depends on how hard you throw people. I guess sometimes, like, she, I, I guess she used it to uh, stab that guy with the magic sword that one time. And in the season finale, she used it to deflect the demon's energy balls back at him. I mean, Prue's power is plenty offensive. Hmm. I guess she... But it, it's more... I guess... Maybe it's a Wicca thing, you know, first do no harm. I guess it's a doctor thing, but the fact that her power is offensive mostly in that it's used to... Do it that will and ye harm none. Hmm. I, it's mostly used to turn other people's powers against them. Yeah. I mean, it was, she stabbed the guy with his own magic sword. Um, she deflected that guy's energies, that guy's energy balls back at him. Uh, she telekinetically moved Hannah on top of Rex after Hannah turned into a tiger. <laughs> oh my god, that was ridiculous. But no, remember last episode, the in the season one finale, Prue was like, we don't kill people, that's not us, we're not about that life. And then the guy threw a energy ball at her and she blew it up in his face, killing him, and she was like, I mean, you know, except when they start it. <laughs> Which, you know, to be fair, is not that bad a philosophy. Yeah. It's also a little bit BS because, I mean, obviously it's a good thing, but Phoebe's power, Phoebe's power makes them start it. Like, the Charmed Ones are often the ones who start it because Phoebe's power shows them that, like, oh, demons are stealing children or whatever. I guess we better go kill those demons. It's like Minority Report, right? Phoebe's the Department of Future Crime. Yes. Speaking of children... There's a knock at the door, and it's neighbor Jenny, who they do not know. She's just some random teen girl who bursts into the house to use their phone. Listen, if a... She's like a tween. If a tween girl rings your doorbell and is like, I need to use your phone, it's an emergency, you let her use your phone. Yeah. Also, uh, Kit Watch 2020. Yeah, Kit Watch 2020. Kit is right by the phone. Uh, Neighbor Jenny is followed very shortly after by neighbor dan who the girls are not suspicious of enough considering how upset jenny was when she ran into the house demanding to use the telephone well i think they're distracted because she asked to use the phone and then she calls the long distance operator and asks to be connected to saudi arabia yes just connect me to all of saudi arabia okay so i don't remember how operators work but i think she is gonna go to like a different opera i don't know how it works I don't know how long distance used to work in the before days, but yes. The Charmed Ones are going to have a real massive phone bill, though. I know that for sure. Luckily, she does not connect, so it'll be okay. But Neighbor Dan, no, of course you can't be suspicious of Neighbor Dan. He's got that floppy early 2000s hair. Yeah, and he's got a chin butt and a wide set jaw. He's like the whole 90s handsome package. He is very, very generic 90s handsome. Yeah. Fun fact, which I should probably say for premonitions, but I'm going to blow it here. Guess who he's married to in real life? Who? Angie Harmon. Interesting. Yeah. I can see that. 
Yeah. So, oh. anyway, he's like... They must have a... I can... They must have so many generically attractive children. <laughs> right. So, he's like, Hi, I'm neighbor Dan. I just moved in next door with my niece, Jenny. Her parents are diplomats or something. Come on, Jenny. Let's go back to my house. And then Jenny storms out of the house, and the girls are like, Okay, well, that happened. We're done. <laughs> Characters established. Let's go back to what we were talking about before. I, it is very a well. I guess that happened. Scene you summed it up perfectly there. <laughs> so Prue does not want to talk about what just happened. The demon thing, not the neighbor Dan thing. She's like, I'm gonna just go to my room. I, I don't have time for demons. And yeah, she's got a brood about demons because, as Piper tells us, this is the first demon she's had to deal with since Andy died. It's nice that demons don't attack during the summer. It's, 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 that, that, that is very considerate of them, you're right. You know what I feel like they should do, but they didn't, especially with the Buffy novels? What's that? I felt like the Buffy novels all should have taken place over the summer, because that's the time where you don't have to be like, when does this fit into the show's continuity? Yeah. I mean, as someone who read a lot of novelizations as a teenager or you know, not novelizations tie-in novels hmm. i never cared about when they fit in actually i guess that wouldn't really work with buffy for the first few years at least because we know where buffy well, was you, you could have novels that take place you know when she was being Anne in la and Ooh, that's actually a really good uh i'm sure there are ones yeah and ones when she's with her dad <laughs> oh yeah we could actually see what her dad is like oh hank summers okay so is he just the worst father in the world, or is he under, like, demonic influence that he doesn't show up when their mom dies? Do you think it's a, uh, do you think it was something with the monks creating Dawn? Where what? they, like, did something to him to keep him away? Yeah, where they're like, it's too many variables if there's, you know this guy who's outside of the sphere of influence when we create this uh, girl? I'm not sure. I mean, I know there are terrible dads. I know it's not outside of the realm of possibility that he's just that terrible, but I don't know. It, it... I mean, he's literally he's literally the uh, nightmare dad from the nightmare episode of Buffy when she's you know, her, when they're ramping up to her biggest fear and she has that conversation with him where he's like, look, I was just never that into having kids. And now that you're away with your mom, I really don't think there's a good reason to continue. Yeah. You know, this. And then at the end of the episode, he shows up and it's like, oh, no, he's not actually that guy. And then later in the show, it's like, actually, he was kind of that guy. Well, no, the fact that he shows up at the end of that episode and is not that guy, but then later in the series is that guy. That's what makes me think there's like some demonic influence. Maybe it's an inverse charmed dad situation. Where their dad got nicer. Yeah. This dad got me. Yeah. <laughs> there has to be, like, it, it's the law of dad relativity, so. They they switched, so he had to, you know, universe needs to balance out and genre show fatherhood. There you go. So, in Charmed, in the episode we're watching, we cut to the demon Abraxas in his astral plane, reading the spells in the book backwards and thus erasing them. <laughs> okay, dude. So here's the thing. Yeah. So this is what's going to happen throughout the episode. He's going to read the vanquishing spells backwards, thereby erasing them and causing the demons that were vanquished to return. Then the girls are going to say the vanquishing spells again and the demons are going to be revanquished. And I just feel like this could be a real comedy of errors that goes on and on indefinitely. Okay, my thing is they've cast non-demon vanquishing spells is he just not reading those shouldn't there be a thing where men are horrified by phoebe and piper yes yes there should or like people can only lie to them well i mean maybe they just got to him too quick for that to happen <sighs> i i think this is a very strong premise for an episode but they kind of don't do a good job with it because they need to set up all of the stuff for season two. Sorry, what? I think this is a good premise for the episode. A demon is reading all it, the. A demon gets the book and is reading all of the spells backwards, and you know they have to deal with the inverse of these spells happening. But that's not what we get. What we get is them having to vanquish a few of demons we've already seen before over again, 
and then that's it. So you think Abraxas would have been better if we'd gotten more screen time with him and less with neighbor Dan and neighbor Jenny? Not with him necessarily, just with the fallout of all of their spells being undone. Yeah, okay, I can see that. So... Especially if Prue thought that it might mean that Andy would come back. See, that would be interesting. Yeah, because we kind of touch on, we haven't gotten to it yet, but the deal with Abraxas, the ticking clock on Abraxas, is that you have to get to him before he gets to the first page, the page that gave them their powers, otherwise they'll lose their powers, and Prue is conflicted because if they lose their powers, then maybe her next boyfriend won't die. Oh, Prue. Yeah, I know, right? It's more interesting if she thinks that Andy might come back. That gives her a stronger reason to do it, because the fact is... There are still demons. If they lose their powers, demons don't stop existing. They just... It's much easier for them to kill them. I mean, I guess demons would stop coming after them because the big thing about killing the Charmed Ones is, you know, getting their powers. I mean, maybe. Would they? I feel like you'd still be really vulnerable just because you know that world exists. Oh, yeah. And... I mean, it's um, the Cruciatum episode of uh, Buffy. Exactly. It... I just, I feel like you're right. This would have been, Prue's motivation would have been a lot stronger if it if she had thought Andy might come back, not if she had thought she might lose her powers. Yeah, because the girls think maybe life will be better if they're just regular people is something that gets ground into the ground <laughs> over the course of this show. It's, it's a dead horse that gets turned into glue. We get this, I think like seven different times more than that we get this so many times later in the show it becomes piper's thing but yeah it's not that great not having powers piper yeah and prue anyway we go to speaking of witches who have no powers apparently mm. we go to the park where all of the wiccans that phoebe met are gathering for their equinox celebration uh by the way their altar is covered with unburnt sage like someone from the prop department just bought a bunch of crap at the witch store at like the actual local witch store but didn't know how to use it so they just like put all of this unburnt sage on top of the altar <laughs> also the main witch that phoebe interacts with is named stevie because brad kern's only frame of reference for a witch-like woman is stevie nicks what is this american horror story coven is the main witch there named stevie too uh, no, but Stevie Nicks shows up as an actual witch near the end of the uh, oh, season. That's amazing! Yes. Uh, as I... herself, as an actual witch. Yes, I love it! That's like in uh, the TV version, that's like in the TV show What We Do in the Shadows, when they... Have the vampire council that are all people who've played vampires in real life. Yes, the vampire council are all people who've played vampires playing themselves. It turns out they're actually vampires. Well, uh... Big Wolf on Campus, which was a... Whoa. Yes. Kind of hokey genre show. Like, it, it's cute. I, I haven't watched it since I was a kid. I'm sure it's aged terribly. Uh, one of the characters from it... Well, one of the actors from it actually is a character briefly in the last season. Oh, that's cool. But uh, there's a thing in it where uh, they fight... Uh, he fights some... Um, the Corys in different episodes because it turns out that on the set of uh, Lost Boys, Lost Boys, they both got turned into vampires by the vampire consultant the uh, movie studio hired. That is awesome. So he uh, he has to fight Feldman and then him or whichever order. But I'm like that, that that's cute. That's cute casting. I love meta monster stories. Oh, do we have to watch Supernatural now? Because I hear it goes real deep into that. Uh, maybe not. I was actually thinking about the movie In the Shadow of a Vampire, where a actual vampire is hired to consult on the on the movie Nosferatu. Oh. Yeah. Oh, do we have to watch uh, the movie version of Bewitched? I actually... Okay, so I've never seen the movie version of Bewitched, and I know it was terrible and panned and everything, but... It's kind of... The plot is really my jam. The plot where... The plot is... The TV show Bewitched exists. And they're making it into a movie. And... They hire, it turns out, an actual witch to play Samantha Stevens in the movie. And that kind of meta-ness is so my jam. Okay. I know this sounds... 
I know how this sounds, but it would have been a really good movie if it had been a different movie with that exact premise instead of it being like because like, it's a solid plot they're like we're doing a remake of Bewitched and the woman who gets cast as Samantha is an actual witch except she's actually kind of Samantha and like she has a mom who's in Dora and she has a Uncle Arthur or whatever but also Bewitched is a fictional show no I mean I'm okay with that like, I'm okay that but it, it's, her life so closely mirrors the TV show. That happens sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I mean, also, it's just, it's not funny at all. See, that's, that's what I fear would be the problem. I fear that I would watch it and I'd be like, ah, I want this to be good. And Nicole Kidman can't do the nose wiggling thing. And it's like, Ooh. and they have like this, this comedy montage with all these actresses who can't do it. And then they cut to Nicole Kidman and... She can't do it either. And they're like, oh my god, she's doing it just like the, you know, just like Elizabeth Montgomery. And I'm like, okay. Oh. That was before she was such box office poison that they didn't even put her name on movies anymore. Nicole Kidman? Yeah. They don't put her, they don't advertise that she's in movies anymore. She had such a bad run of movies. That's weird. I don't, I don't associate her with bad movies. You don't associate her with, like, the kiss of death she had for a while there no do you remember the golden compass movie that's not her fault that is not her fault but or uh i don't know this was definitely a thing for a while there to the degree that they stopped advertising that she was in movies bewitched is another one of her very very famous failures i mean is it because her movies failed because lots of people have movies that flop is it because her movies failed or is it because she pissed off scientology it it could be. How much power does Scientology have now? A lot. Wait. I, I Their power is definitely waning. But I feel like they they had a... I feel like a lot of Hollywood people are Scientologists. So mm. at, at some point, if you're a Hollywood person, pissing off Scientology is not a good idea. Not that you should stay married to Tom Cruise. You definitely shouldn't stay married to Tom Cruise. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about the... Uh... God, what was it the uh, i think it was the honest trailer for uh the gay volleyball movie top, top gun? gun where it's like starring confirmed catholic tom cruise oh was he apparently hmm. <laughs> i'm assuming that whoever did honest trailers did their research wasn't there a thing with them i know we stopped watching them for some reason was it just because they weren't funny anymore or was there a scandal? I feel like there might have been a scandal, but it's been so long and there's been so much stuff out in the universe. I don't remember. Charmed. So, back to Charmed. Uh, the scene that you had hinted at before happens where the witches declare that they are doing this ritual skyclad. Yes. Here's the thing. like I, I love how shitty Piper is being about all of this witch stuff. Like, yeah. she's being such a raging asshole to everyone. I'm sorry, go on. I just... Okay, doing rituals naked is a thing that some people do. That's not... Okay. But they are way out in the open in the middle of the afternoon. Like, I just... I feel like that is bizarre. But also, you're right. Piper is being really shitty about, like, the nudity, you know? She's being really shitty about everything. Like, the head witch lady, Stevie, comes over and she's like, Oh, hello, Phoebe. Who is your friend? Is she also a true believer? And Piper's basically making jerk-off motions and rolling her eyes. She's like, Boy, you sure have an eclectic group of friends here, don't you? Are they all witches? Oh, speaking of, the thing with that we were discussing at the top of this episode about witches. Uh, when she asks if they're all witches, Stevie's like, oh no, we're not all witches. Some of us are just believers. And it's like, right, because somehow the show is making a distinction between people who are Wiccan and people who actually have powers. Like, uh, it's, it's really annoying. But yes, the girls decide to get naked. And look, here's the thing. Don't be such a prude, Piper. I, I, I guess if you don't want to get naked, don't get naked. But... It's just a body. Calm down. So, 
Phoebe and Piper strip down behind a rock, and Piper is like, you know, Piper, you can just like leave if you don't want to be here. Also, can you put? I, I guess you can keep your jewelry in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why would you take your jewelry off? It feels like a. If you're gonna be naked, shouldn't you be all naked? D- well, they're also. I'm almost certain gonna keep their shoes on, which they really definitely should. Yes, Piper asks if she can keep her shoes on, and Phoebe says yes, but that's it. Well, I mean, you know, they're on the ground. Also, Phoebe, like I said, she's done her hair in those braids, and I'm not sure what necklace she's wearing, but it looks like it's got like a woven chain. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure, I'm sure she picked a necklace that has witchy properties. So you would definitely want to keep that on. Meanwhile, Piper has this kind of starfish thing clip in her hair. Yeah, I think it's just a clip. Yeah. <laughs> It, it doesn't look very mystical. So, here's the thing about being around a bunch of people who are naked in public. You stop thinking about it after a very short period of time. You really do. And Okay, so when we first moved to Portland, mm-hmm. uh, our friend uh, invited me to a, uh, like a hot springs. Mm-hmm. And he told me it is clothing optional with hot springs. Yes. Uh... Which I took literally to mean clothing optional. In retrospect, I feel like he should have told me, everyone will be naked. And if you are not naked, you're going to feel super uncomfortable. And I don't really own swimsuits, so I put on what I swim in, which is like surfing gear. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to just slip out of. So... I was, like, fully clothed, and everyone around me was naked, and I felt so uncomfortable. Well, I mean, the thing is, you just don't want to be in a different state from everyone around you. Yeah, yeah. So, Phoebe hears a voice that whispers, The power of three. Not just a voice. Grams' voice. And now, to be fair, Piper is like, when Phoebe says she hears Grams, Piper, like, moves to cover herself, and I'm like, okay, that's, that's fair. Yes. That's fair. You don't want Grams to watch you naked. Although she probably does see you naked all the time because she, you know... Is a ghost who lives in your house? Yes. And has no sense of boundaries? Lives. Oh, right. (laughs) Whatever, you know what I meant. So, meanwhile, Prue is hosting an auction at the auction house and she's dressed for work, which is nuts. I actually put in my notes that she is in her morning suit... Because she's wearing, like, an all-black business suit. We never see her in suits. And this one is all black. And I feel like this is definitely... She is in mourning for Andy. It is the most professional she's ever looked. Also, other people work here now? What? Well, so... I'm actually not sure how many of these people are actually Buckland's employees. And how many of them are just workmen who have come in for this auction. We only really see her interacting with the woman whose stuff is being auctioned off whose husband's stuff is being auctioned off. Right. She's a widow, and so she has to sell her husband's stuff, and she talks to Prue about, you know, how hard it is to be a widow. Her husband died in an accident, and, you know, she's still in mourning. It's rough. Yeah. And she she talks about how there are all these things, like, she keeps on going over that day in her mind, and she's thinking, like, if I had stopped him from, you know, getting in the car, or if I had done this, that, and the other, maybe he wouldn't be dead. And Prue's like... I could one-up this story so easily. (laughs) I mean, she could, but honestly, she's... She's just sad. She's she's obviously so sad. If you say so. She she really, uh... Shannon Doherty's not really putting in the acting effort this uh, episode. Wow, mean. Uh... We've seen her act, and she's not doing it right now. <laughs> so we go from that scene to the the club that Piper wants to buy, which is currently, I guess, the, the club that was immediately there before was called the Industrial Zone. Okay, so it was a gay club, right? Right? Whole steel industry went gay back in the 80s. Here's the thing about the Industrial Zone. Mm-hmm. Because we know that the last two, because Piper tells us, the last two clubs that were in there have gone out of business. Mm -hmm. I feel like I would not go to a club called the Industrial Zone because I would think it was a laser tag place. Yeah, it doesn't really sound like a club so much. 
Although there is a club back in Boston, I I never went to it because I used to go to clubs like once a year just to kind of remind me why I don't like going to clubs. Sure, sure. Oh wow, it's you know really really loud and you can't control the music and all of the alcohol is really expensive and everyone smells terrible. Everyone doesn't smell terrible. Everyone smells like a conflicting uh, array of perfumes and colognes, which forms this kind of miasma of... What, what were you going to say about this club, though, that you went to? Oh, uh, I didn't go to it. I went to different clubs. But I was aware of a club that was called Church. Uh, <laughs> that's so hipster, it physically hurts me. Oh, my God. And then you're all like, yeah, I'm going to church. Oh, my God, I hate it. I hate it so much. Club industry is probably not doing so hot right now. Yeah, almost certainly not. Uh, oof, yeah. But I mean, the weird thing about clubs is that the thing they really sell is exclusivity. I don't know if that's really... I think that's the case in some cities. Probably in... And I think it depends on the club. Yeah, I, I don't think that's always the case. Mm. I, I, I think that's more stereotypical of... I, I think that's more what I've seen on TV than what I've experienced in actual clubs. That was my experience in when we went clubbing in Italy. But that was... You also might not be... You also might not get that because you are, you know, a girl. Oh, maybe. In order to get into clubs in Italy, we had to... Luckily, I was in a, I was in a college... I, I did an exchange program... And luckily, it skewed heavily female. But in order to get into a club, you would need the wall of breasts, as we refer to it as. Huh, because I went clubbing when I was in Italy, and I had no issues. I, I, I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Did you go clubbing with dudes? I went by myself because... So you were your own wall of breasts. I was my own wall of breasts. Because when I did my semester in Italy... I was doing it through a different college than the one I attended, mm -hmm. so I didn't really know any of the people that I was with, uh, because the exchange programs my college had were to Switzerland and Australia, and I didn't want to do either of those. I mean, whatever, it's fine. I could have. But I didn't want to do either of those, so I did the Italy one. Uh, our, we had, you know, set up so that you could go through other schools. Anyway, so I went to Italy with another school. Hmm. And I didn't know anyone there. And also, it was a Catholic school. So, I, I mean, I am, I am myself a former Catholic, so it's not. But it was, it was, uh, we, we were very different people. Yes. Yes. Wait, was this in high school? No, this was in college. There are Catholic colleges. I didn't know New College was. This was University of Alabama. Oh, grad school. Okay. Yeah, this was in my grad school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, this was when I was in law school. I actually studied uh, Vatican, I studied canon law, which Ooh. was awesome. Yeah, it was really interesting. But, yeah. Clubbing. Piper setting up a club. Yeah, oh, by the way, this club is being sold by SWA Properties, which you may remember as the real estate company that Phoebe worked for for a hot minute before she was asked to cover for her cheating boss. Oh, Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, continuity. All right, let's talk about what Piper is doing. Piper is buying a club because it's similar to a restaurant, which is what she really wants to do. Yeah. What? What, what is even happening with this show? Like, well, honest. Why not just open a restaurant? She talks to him. She talks to the guy about how she's like, well, I really want to open a restaurant, but a club seems easier. No, it's not. It, it also has a whole bunch of skills you don't have. I mean, let's be let's be honest here. What's happening is the show wants their own bronze and their own peach pit, right? They want a venue where you can bring on musical acts and do that for the show. Yeah. So they're creating P3. But in the show, Piper's like, it's almost like a restaurant, but not quite. So yeah, close enough. Yeah, I don't, what is this thing where she's like, I'm 75% following my dreams? I quit my job to follow my dreams and, you know. <laughs> Close enough. Close enough. What? What? I, the fact that, as I said, uh, the reason that they're doing this is obviously so that 
they can bring musical acts onto the TV show. Yeah. It just emphasizes that is a skill set Piper has zero of, right? Piper doesn't know how to book acts. I mean... Uh, it, yes. In-universe, Piper opening a club makes no sense whatsoever, but... She gets approved for the loan. The guy's like, I hey. I mean, tentatively approved. Yeah. She hasn't signed anything yet, but the guy's like, hey, I'll approve anything you want as long as you sign my, you know, dick with your tongue. Oh, so here's the thing. He says that he will approve it at the risk of her never wanting to date him again. <laughs> oh, God. What he means is this club is going to be an albatross around your neck. This is gonna be a this is a terrible idea. It's gonna be hard work and you're almost certainly gonna fail, but I'm gonna go ahead and approve the loan and you're gonna hate me later because you're gonna hate running this club. But that means he's approving a loan for a business he thinks is gonna fail. That's not good business. Seriously. Seriously. How is I'm just gonna assume that he gets fired right after this because Well, I mean, spoiler, but he ends up not approving the loan. True. For reasons completely unrelated to... I mean, I guess... It, anyway, so Abraxas... We cut back to Abraxas, who is sitting in his astral hole, and he unreads the spell they used to vanquish Jeremy, which one would think would be a lot earlier in the book, but... Eh. Well, I mean, I, we know that the spells aren't in order, so it's okay. Yeah. So, also, they didn't vanquish him using a spell from the book, they vanquished him using a spell from the back of the spirit board, but whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, that'll come up. Uh, the thing that is weird to me is that Abraxas, you know, unvanquishes him, and he says, Were you vanquished by the Charmed Ones? And Jeremy goes, Yeah? Why? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, Jeremy. We don't even finish that scene and Braxis just, like, bamps him over to where Piper is. So, Piper's making out with... Rob. Rob. And Grams whispers in her ear, The power of three! Grams is just a real, uh... Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So, Jeremy bamps in from behind Piper and wangs uh, Rob on the back of the head and he's like, I'm gonna stab you to Piper and Piper, like, ugh, we're crying out loud. And then she conference calls Prue and Phoebe. Yeah, she conference calls Prue and Phoebe, and she puts them all on speakerphone so that they can vanquish via speakerphone, which I have to admit, I really love. It's like vanquishing for the witch on the go, you know? I also really like how Phoebe answers the phone AT&T Power of Three, which... I hope they have caller ID because otherwise I think she she said that I believe she said that when Prue linked them all together. Ah. So yeah, they all they vanquished Jeremy via speakerphone. I love that. And uh it's a good thing that this was the vanquishing spell that they all, you know, the power of 3 will set, set us, us free. free. The power of 3 will set us free. And I think they literally just used the same green screen image of him exploding because he does the whole holding his fists over his hand and shaking them. I, like, I feel like it was something they had green screened. Possibly. Possibly. So he blows up real quick and Piper's like, well, that happened. <laughs> then commercial break and we come back to Rob being loaded into an ambulance and him comedically being like, ow, 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 ow. He's also, like, first of all, he's angry at Piper for not seeing who did this to him. Like, I th Also, they put him in a hospital gown? No, 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 they, they, that's not a hospital gown. That's just his terrible 80s shirt. Oh. Or, sorry. No, no, that's not a hospital gown. That's just his terrible 90s shirt. Oh. Okay. It looks awful, and he talks about how... He's not approving the loan now that he's been attacked and they, you know, take him out. And well, then... he says, he says because it's a high crime area. Did you not know this before? Also, this is a, this is kind of a, a fallacy. This is a bias because he's been attacked. He now believes it's a high crime area, but statistically speaking, it's not. Hmm. Also, he has a, as, as he's being wheeled out by the uh, paramedics, Prue walks in and goes, hey, how are you doing? It's kind of like a comedic thing. It's like, 
I don't know. It's a joke that aggressively does not land for me. Yeah. It just makes me think of this scene in Happy Endings where, uh, remember where Zach Morris and Max end up in the same, uh, in the same hospital room Uh after, uh, Max fixed his life and then he ruined it because he assumed that Zach Morris was trying to ruin it because Zach Morris swore that he would ruin his life. And he has that speech about how he almost died, but he came back because he knew he couldn't leave this mortal plane until he had destroyed Max as thoroughly as possible. And Max is like, did you see how they timed out, like, <laughs> wheeling him out just as he finished the speech? Do you think he practiced that with the nurse? I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up happy endings, because it's going to come up again during premonitions. <gasps> Ooh. Wait, was Jenny on happy endings? No. Was neighbor Dan on happy endings? No. Was the widow on happy endings? No. Is Abraxas someone on happy endings? I'm trying... Rob, the guy who just got wheeled out was on happy endings. Oh, okay. I don't know. Abraxas could have been one of, one of Penny's guys of the week. Oh, I mean, he could have been. He's under so much makeup. Yeah. Although usually when you have guys under that much makeup, they're like mimes or physical actors like Doug Jones. Hmm. So anyway, Prue's like, so what happened here and piper's like i don't know jeremy came back from the dead do you think we're gonna have to deal with other people who we had once fought coming back from the dead but also i heard grams whisper in my ear the power of three do you think she was trying to warn me and also important note she says uh she's definitely not getting the loan any chance you have sixty thousand dollars to lend me Mm. yeah Mm. meanwhile phoebe is on a 90s computer doing witch research she also has some witch books scattered around yeah she they don't have the book of shadows so she has to look up abraxas in the books she bought from the witch bookstore this must be way more useful witch books than you can buy in real life i don't know i feel like witch books in real life don't give you so much information on demons that live on the astral plane i guess not anyway although i guess it would make more sense in charmed universe that you know you'd probably be able to buy more demon books there yeah yeah so she looks out the window and she sees neighbor jenny sitting on her stoop all sad petting kit and phoebe goes over and it's like she goes over like a friendly big sister but i feel like she just went over to get her cat back because jenny (laughs) is petting kit the phoebe has some giant ass shoes i like her shoes yeah they are they're really they're really clunky wedges but I, i like them yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they're bad or anything. I'm just like, you better hope demons don't attack when you're wearing those. Uh, in the show, when is that ever an issue, though, so. Yeah. Anyway, she goes to talk to Jenny, and Jenny's like, yeah, my, my dad's a diplomat. My parents are in Saudi Arabia. And... Where children are banned. Well, I mean, her parents want her to finish out school or whatever. Who is she, a Goosebumps protagonist? Yes. Uh... Well, she's going to be a Judy Bloom protagonist right now because the reason she's so upset is because her period is coming and she asked neighbor Dan to go buy her tampons and he bought sanitary napkins instead. Okay, here's the thing. Is her problem that neighbor Dan is deeply, deeply stupid? He's not that stupid. She asked him to buy tampons and he bought sanitary napkins. You know what you do? You go to the store and you see the box that says tampons and you buy them. Okay, Uh, sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm really just mad at Phoebe here because neighbor Jenny is like, can you help me out, please? And Phoebe's like, um, I'm really busy. Also, I'm pretty sure that your parents wouldn't have sent you to live with someone that they didn't think could handle it. So just talk to him. And it's like, Phoebe, just give her some tampons. (laughs) Like, don't make this like 13 year old have another awkward conversation with her uncle there are three women in your house i'm sure you have an extra box of tampons you can give her like and then and then she's like tell you what go talk to your uncle again and if he still doesn't help you then you can come over and i'll help you out just give her a box i love how she's like and remember you can come to our house anytime you need except for right now (laughs) remember we're always here if you need help except for now (laughs) so she and then she grabs kit and she runs into the house you know towards piper because she's like that's it the power of three she she saw the toy 
She saw the triquatra on Kit's collar, and that made her realize that the power of one really meant the power of three, because... Mm. The book is being unnecessarily dickish this week. I feel like they should honestly have more questions about where Kit came from. Kit was that other witch is familiar, remember? No, I know that. They don't. Oh, they don't? Oh. Kit <laughs> just showed up the night that they got their powers with a, with a collar that had their symbol on it. Oh, you're right. That does raise some questions. So... They break out the spirit board, which I feel like the show kind of underutilizes. It really does. Um, Phoebe has the very logical revelation that the spirit board is what brought them to the Book of Shadows the first time, so they'll just ask the spirit board. And the spirit board also unhelpfully just gives them the name of the demon, which is Abraxas. And it's like... Thanks. This isn't... This, speaking of, this isn't Wizard of Earthsea. It's not more helpful now that you know its true name. Yes. So... We cut back to Abraxas, who's undoing a, one of the spells, and then we go back- Um, I'm sorry. Do you want to say what spell he's undoing? What spell is he undoing? The Woogie Man Vanquishing. Another spell that they didn't get from the Book of Shadows. You're right. Grams made it up, and then she put it in that story that, yeah, that's also not in the book. What the hell? I mean, I, did, I think the girls- think they might have wrote- I'm they, sure the girls wrote it in afterwards, and that's- so it's fine that it's in the book- but I don't feel like you should be able to unvanquish him by reading it out of the book when they didn't use the book to vanquish him. Yes. So, also, there's a thing where, like, Phoebe only remembers half of it and Piper only remembers half of it. But Phoebe was the one who remembered the whole thing. I mean, she's got a she's got a shadow demon coming around her. It's fine. It, it, that, that part does it, That was actually listed as an error on this episode on the wiki page. I don't actually have a problem with that. That's, people, people panic and forget things. Hmm. So I guess yeah. I guess the Wookiee Man spell wasn't a power of three spell because we know Grams came up with it. Right. So. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, that part I actually thought was good continuity. That's not a power of three spell, so they didn't need Prue to do it. Yeah. So I do like that Piper immediately jumps to the right conclusion, which is, oh, Abraxas must be reading the spells backwards and therefore undoing them. She's got really good spatial memory that she knows where in the book each spell is. So she's like, oh right, Jeremy's spell was almost all the way in the back, and then the Wookiee Man spell was before that. Honestly, I feel like that should have probably been Phoebe's line. Why is that? I feel like Phoebe spends more time with the book. I, like, she's more of the one who's in oh. the witch stuff. So. Okay, that's Phoebe definitely spends more time with the book. I thought you meant you thought Phoebe should have better spatial memory. I was like, really? No. no, no. I, I was like, I was really ready to dive into, like, your theory of mind for all the girls. Okay. So, speaking of Phoebe's mind, she touches the, the picture of the three of them. You know, the iconic picture of the three of them. Hmm. And has a vision of Nicholas, you know, the one that their mother made a deal with. She has a vision of Nicholas. The guy who was such a huge honking deal that Grams needed to seal away their powers. Yeah. Instead of just, I don't know, hitting him with her car. She has a vision of Nicholas killing Prue. Also, by the way, she calls him the Warlock Nicholas. I just saw the Warlock Nicholas killing Prue. Just, I just want to mark that, okay? Phoebe had a vision of the warlock Nicholas killing Prue. Okay. Okay. So now we're back at Buckland's. Uh, Prue has changed out of her morning business suit into her morning spaghetti strap dress. <laughs> Is this a mistress morning? Uh, she went from wife morning uh, suit to mistress morning suit. Oh, interesting. So some guy who works, you know... At Buckland's? Yeah, is like, hey... Claire wants to talk to you, and Prue's like, Claire's not a person anymore. Shut up. Actually, no. Okay, I know you're making a joke, but I need to talk about what he really says. Mm -hmm. Because he says, your sister Phoebe's on the phone. She says it's important. And Prue's like, ugh, she always says it's important. Yeah, Prue, it usually is. It's usually a demon. You should take the call. Hey, remember the last phone call you had where someone was trying to kill Piper? And you had to vanquish him on speakerphone? Like... What is going on with you, Prue? Seriously. So, Prue has a grief off with the widow. I, I like this because she didn't say anything in their previous grief off. Because the, the widow's like, you're doing such a good job selling all of my dead husband's crap. And Prue's like, well, I think that speaks more to your dead husband's wonderful taste and crap than any skill on my part. 
Now, even though Prue has not said anything in their grief off before, she's like, I sensed in our previous conversation that you too have just lost your partner to death. So, uh, how, how is, how are how is your grieving going? And she's like, well, my boyfriend? Yeah, sure. Why not? My boyfriend died a lot more recently than your husband. So, you know, yep. check yourself. Plus, plus, he was younger, which makes it sadder, we're assuming. Yeah. I mean, maybe not. Maybe this woman was, like, a total uh, cougar. My last three husbands were old, and they died, and that's how I got my money, so I thought I'd finally get a husband that was for me, and then he goes off and dies anyway. God, that's depressing. It's kind of like that line in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, where she's like, age doesn't matter. You can die at any time. Yes. So, the warlock Nicholas just teleports in the middle of this auction like and, and re- really dude really to, to be clear this is the part of the auction where people like wander around and look at the stuff before we actually get to the bidding so you know people are mingling yes but yeah still nobody notices this giant blonde ghost <laughs> come through the wall and Prue's like nicholas and she just kind of walks away from the widow mid-sentence she runs to her office presumably so that we don't have to deal with anybody else seeing uh yeah. this and she looks, in, as soon as she gets into her office, you know, so that he can kill her in private. Yeah. Yeah. She looks at her hand, and he's like, you remember my power. I'm going to make you melt. Well, yes. Uh, but also, he took their power, so I think she's looking at her hand because she can't do anything right now. Uh, she does, though, remember the vanquishing spell, and she says it vanquishing him which means phoebe's vision was wrong yeah they have not done anything to intervene and yet prue did not die phoebe was just wrong also i just want to point this out i know it holds no actual bearing but uh last time they needed a sack of ingredients yeah. To cast the spell, and this time Prue just listed the ingredients that they actually had, and it makes him blow up, so magic feather situation, I guess. No, I think, like, the power of those ingredients was, like, saved in the words, <laughs> since they've already done it once. So, commercial break, and then Prue's at the hospital, and the doctor's like, you know, most people don't just spontaneously get fever so bad it makes them pass out and then it goes away. Maybe you should hang around the hospital for a little bit. And Prue's like, Pfft. Prue's like, no, it's okay. I know what it was. I won't let it happen again. Okay, bye. Doctor's like, you don't want to tell me what it was because this is pretty weird. Prue's like, I don't really think that's any of your business, doctor. It is weird how, like, quickly they're able to get in and out of that hospital yeah the doctor's like okay you're discharged i guess and this whole thing is just to establish like why prue might not care so much that they're losing their powers right because phoebe and piper fill her in about how they've realized he's going backwards to the book and he's going to get to the first page and they're going to lose their powers and this is where prue's like okay well maybe i don't care about losing my powers If you didn't have your powers, you would have died, Prue. Yeah, like a second ago. Yeah. So, Phoebe brings up the fact that, hey, the book can't leave the house, but it can exist in the house on a different plane, and that's probably where he is, and it's probably the astral plane, because that's, you know, the one that's super easy to get to, I guess. Yeah. She's like, there's infinite planes, but there's one that's, like, right next to ours. Like, right there. So... They still don't get the stupid thing with the power of three. Right. Yeah, I thought she got it when she saw the triquatra, but no. She's like, nope, you're the you're the power of one. You're the one power, Prue. So uh, we'll go home. We'll open a window to the astral plane. You'll use your one power. We'll get the book back, and then uh, we'll go on with our lives. Which, why did you get so excited about the triquatra earlier then if you didn't figure it out? I mean, maybe you just reminded her of the spirit board? Oh, probably. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. So, I have an MVP extra, which is a guy who's wandering around with a potted thing of flowers in a t-shirt that's way too big for him that's tucked into his pants and possibly underwear. Oof. Yeah. 
he's there briefly, but you see him go by from multiple directions behind them as they're talking. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. They, they must have just sent that extra across the frame for every single take they did. Yeah. Why would you do that? I mean, I guess I didn't notice it, so. I, yeah, and I don't think I would have noticed it if I didn't notice the fact that he had his shirt tucked into his pants. Yeah, yeah. The, and, the back I, of his pants. Right, he has, a, he has a backwards French tuck. I mean, obviously not on purpose. Clear, probably not on purpose. Just like one handful in the back tucked in. Meanwhile, in the foreground of all of this, Prue's like, you know what? I don't care if he undoes all of her magic. I'm sick of being a witch. All we ever do is lose people. And as as you know, people who aren't witches never lose loved yep. ones. Yep, that's accurate. So, Piper reassures Phoebe that Prue will come around. And Phoebe's like, I don't know. We're It seems, it seems pretty much like we're screwed. Piper's like, we're more screwed than you know. We're out of wine because we're women on a TV show and wine's the only alcohol we can have. So Piper's like, we're out of wine. And then neighbor Dan shows up at the door with wine. Like. Weird. Right? I, I, I Phoebe comments about it. She's like, oh, wow, your timing's impeccable. But also, hey, we're, we're out of billion dollar checks, too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I, I mean, you know what? I think... Hey, you know what they're out of? They're out of the $60,000 that uh, Piper needs to open the club. Okay, to be fair, that actually is going to work. Mm. I, you know what? I think Piper is reading the secret. I, I'm, this is too early for her to be reading the secret. Mm. Time-wise, the secret hasn't come out yet. But Piper's been reading the secret, and she's, like, manifesting all of these things into her life, including Neighbor Dan. Maybe she cast that spell Willowcast in that one uh, season four episode, the My Will Be Done spell. There you go. Something Blue, right, is the name of that episode? I think, yeah. Anyway, so Phoebe's like, so are you going to buy some tampons for your niece, or do I need to literally go down and hold your hand, you simpleton? And he's like... Is that able? Is really mm, maybe, is yeah. You Man. pile of grass eating a sandwich. <laughs> and he's like, okay, I will go buy the tampons, but... Can you just tell me what size I should get? And she's like, you should buy the box that literally says it's for teenagers. Yeah, I I'm sorry. This is one of those things where it's like, are you incapable of using basic logic? She asked you to get tampons and you bought her something that's not tampons. And then, like, how do you need your handheld this much? Buying tampons is not difficult. Ugh. I, I, it's such a... It's such a stereotypical thing, and it's like, it's such a stereotypical, oh, guys can't handle this thing thing. And it's just so not that difficult. And it's not even, it's not even portrayed like he was embarrassed about it. He's just like, bumbling guy, can't get the tampons. What's that, uh, that one episode of King of the Hill where, uh, Connie's staying with, uh, with them and then she gets her first period and hank has to take her to uh get tampons and, and he figures it out he does but yeah oh god hank hill does a better job but you, you remember he he throws a blanket over her before taking her to the store oh i did not remember <laughs> that oh i did not remember that part which dear lord hank i i it's not hank's fault we know he grew up and just i i i like that not only did he figure it out but when he's because he's babysitting Connie, uh, he has like the child care manual that Con gave him, and he adds a new page to the child care manual about how to buy tampons. Yeah, it was like IL thirteen C or whatever. Yes. It's not that difficult. I just I have a hard time rewatching King of the Hill because uh, Yeah. It's your your friendly neighbor conser your friendly neighborhood conservative uh, reads a lot different in twenty twenty. Yeah, someone should punch Alex P. Keaton in the face. Well, that's kind of how that read back in the eighties too. <laughs> yeah, and also, I I think King of the Hill is a good show, but it does kind of suffer from a serious case of every episode being more or less the same. 
Yeah, the thing that TV tropes calls Aesop amnesia. Yeah. Like, nobody grows because they have to learn the same lessons every episode. And it went on for, like, 13 seasons. Yeah, it gets a little rough. Anyway. But, but you know, it was meant to be watched one episode at a time, not not marathoned the way we do now. Yes, one episode at, one episode at a time separated by weeks. Yeah, and, and just dropped into, not, like, consistently watched every week. I feel like the, these are issues we're going to run into with Charmed think you might be right so piper talks about how bummed out she is that she's not going to get to open the club that she didn't want to open in the first place i mean it's almost a restaurant max so she's like i'm glad i never slept with that guy why i mean so, would, you, so, would you have just been would you have been okay with sleeping with him if you w- got what you wanted out of it the fact that she says she's glad she never slept with him means that despite what she said in the first scene she was only making out with him to get the loan yeah yeah not the best look piper although i mean it's your business you, you gotta know. do what you gotta do yeah no judgment you know you do you i guess so now we get a scene that i I have very little notes on, but because it's just, like, the scene that we need to have for the show to continue. Yeah. This is the scene that we need to have for Dorian Gregory to stay in the opening credits. Yes. Yeah, so Prue goes to the station to talk to Daryl about, you know, Andy dying. And Daryl tells her what she doesn't know because she's been avoiding him for a month, which is that Andy told him before he died that the sisters kind of had a thing. He didn't tell them. He didn't tell him that they were witches, but they had a thing, and they had stopped a bunch of murders, and if Andy died that night, it was not Prue's fault. Hmm. Okay, so... Wait, wait. Hold on. My Prue Hallowell didn't kill me t-shirt is raising a lot of questions that I think are already answered by the t-shirt. God. Also... Prue mentions that the main reason they weren't arrested for Andy's murder was because of Daryl? Uh, like, oh, this is a way more searing indictment of the police system than I think it was intended to be. Right? Okay, Daryl also says, I didn't ask him any questions, he was my partner. Which is some real rewriting of history based on what we saw. I mean... I mean he was asking a lot of questions. He was at the end he was at the end of his rope with Andy. Like he was on the verge of turning on Andy as far as the things Andy had asked him to accept. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I think he was like a couple episodes before that, but I think in the episode where Andy died, he was I mean, again, inconsistent writing. But I feel like in the episode where Andy died, he was on Andy's side because he was, you know, defending him against the uh, demon cop. Oh, yeah, I guess he was doing that. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so Daryl's going to stay in the show. Daryl's going to be the cop friend who runs plates for them. Yeah. Daryl says, look, I really, really, really don't want to know what you're doing. I massively do not want to know what you're doing. Please, please do not tell me what you were doing. But if you need any help doing what you're doing, I can help. And Prue's like good good because we need this also i guess i'm sad that andy died when and, and daryl's like yeah right there with you buddy yeah it's i it's in my head i'm comparing a lot of these scenes in my head i'm comparing a lot of these scenes with prue being sad about andy to this to the scenes we're gonna have in a few seasons of piper being sad about prue and it's just highlighting for me how much less Shannon Doherty is selling her grief than Piper will. I mean, honestly, not in this case, but last episode I think we touched on it a little. The Prue being sad over Andy scenes suffer so much from coming right after the Piper being sad that Leo was in the process of dying. Yes. I and- mean, it's just like... You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to get in a grief off, or and you don't want to get in an act off with Holly Marie Combs. She's gonna smoke you. Apparently, which yeah, I. There are moments. There are moments in this show where you remember that Holly Marie Combs is a really good actress. 
So, back in the manor, Piper and Phoebe have drawn a triquatra on the wall in chalk, and they're going to open a door to the astral plane so that they can fight Abraxas and get the book back. Okay. Phoebe's like, do you think this is going to work? And Piper's like, I hope so. Otherwise, I ruined this wall for nothing. You drew on it with chalk. Calm down. Seriously. So Prue shows up and they're like, are you ready to fight? And she telekinetically moves a chair and she's like, yeah. See, look, I've done my obligatory uh, use of power in this episode. Okay, and I mean, to be fair, that makes sense because she has not used her power once this episode, even when she should have, because she's so, you know, distraught. In fact, there is a deleted scene of her using her powers in the auction house specifically i i feel like that's a good deletion because you want her to not be using her powers until she needs to i want to point out she channels her powers through her eyes here yes this is the first time she's done it since the first time she did it it's a, it's a weird sentence but you know what i mean yes it's the first time she's done it since she realized she could channel it through her hands which is it's like she's regressing yeah So they get ready, they open the portal through touching. I do like how they're sort of, it's kind of a reflection of the uh, thing that they did a lot more early on. Yeah, they did this with uh, the time travel spells, they, they, yeah, they've done this before. And they open the window to Abraxas who's like, hey, good, an opportunity to monologue at you! I'm going to destroy the book and then I'm going to come destroy you! And Prue just stands there, doesn't do anything. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't do the the whole plan relies on Prue blasting this guy and she just stands there. And then he kind of gently force pushes them over. I, I he's I guess he's not ready to kill them yet because he still needs to destroy the book or something. I, feel I like... mean it makes sense because if he doesn't destroy the book first and he kills the girls first, then it's just gonna turn out that uh that Patty had a bunch of other kids. <laughs> And that's just going to be a new power of three. God. It's a new show. It's going to be uh, Aviva and Max and uh, Paige. Yeah, there you go. New power of three. So, Piper and Phoebe start yelling at Prue for freezing up. And Prue's like, excuse me, there were three witches up there. Yeah, like, but the plan involved her. Yeah. <laughs> the plan involved her force pushing him back so that they could grab the book. So, yeah, she really did. She really did mess well, this up. Boy, does this kind of feel like okay? This happened because uh, they needed to fill out a certain amount of time in the episode. Okay, I sh- I feel like this is supposed to be Shannon Doherty's like Emmy moment. She's like everything is always on my shoulders because I am the oldest and I'm the one who has to keep people from dying and they all die and I'm sorry it's not good if I'm so powerful how come I couldn't save Andy I, I, and they're like I well to... you, you could have if we just kept the time loop going but nah I hate to be mean to Shannon Doherty because she's 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 trying she's doing her best mm. but it's just it's not uh moving me as it were and she... her, her telekinesis power is not is not working and also this scene is failing to move me too and she's like how can we be good witches if we can't save the people we love and it's like you save other people like i mean honestly at this point in the show your save record's pretty solid also as piper rightly points out you told andy not to come and he came like that is 100 percent on him yeah like if you if you tell someone not to run off a cliff and they run off a cliff it's not your fault because you're telling them not to run off cliffs skills aren't high enough. Right? <laughs> like Andy ran literally right into a dude's energy bolt. That's 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 on him. I mean, I guess it's on the demon, but Piper's like, "Look, I got over my whole ghost boyfriend thing. You need to get over this. We need to get our powers back." Or we're all gonna die. So they all hug. And when they hug, they hear Graham's whispering, The power of three. And it's like, bitch, <laughs> you could have just written that in the book instead of making it unnecessarily confusing. Yes, 
Yes, and this this is when they finally figure out, oh, wait, the power of one actually meant the three of us acting as one. Oh, I see. The power of one was a metaphor for the power of three. God. Okay, and then, okay. <laughs> Grams is such a dick. <laughs> then! Also, I like that she refused to talk to Prue just by herself. Right, only when she was hugging her sisters. Then... God, Grams must be so honked off that Prue's the one she has to spend time with after she gets killed. Oh! Then Phoebe decides that the thing they have to do is sneak up on Abraxas, like, from behind. So they need to open the astral portal somewhere other than the mansion. They need to go to a place where they are more powerful. And this made me Whoa. so angry. The source of your power is the manor. Not this weird altar in the park where you got naked with some girls that Brad Kern had a crush on. Your house is literally built on a nexus. It's literally the center of a bunch of ley lines. That's why it's there. There shouldn't be a part. There shouldn't be a place in San Francisco that's more powerful than the house. Yeah. Yeah. Although, well, so let's talk about what happens, though, because they go to the park mm. and they set up on the altar where, you know, the ceremony was before and they, you know, do a, do a spell. They, they recite a spell uh, to invoke the power of three and the spell opens up the astral portal again. Yes. And when the astral portal opens up, the book just falls through it. Mm. So if it hadn't been, oh, we have to go where we're most powerful, and if it had instead been what I feel like it was, which was we need to leave the manor because people other than us can't take the book out of the manor. So if we open the astral window outside of the manor, the book will just snap back to us, which is what happens. Yes. Like, that makes more sense. Anyway, then Abraxas opens the portal again and is like, hey, what the F, dude? And <laughs> then he just gets vanquished. Okay, I do I do really love where he's like, why did you bring me here? Which is such a weird statement to make. Like, why is that your question? Why did you bring me here? I mean, More, <laughs> what are you doing? We're like, gonna fight, dude. What are you... <laughs> but he blows up and they're like, well, that was easy. We'll never have problems again. We'll never have problems again. And I guess once he kerploded, all of the spells went back into the book? Yes. Sure. Yes. And, okay, apparently this was all a rite of passage. Right, it was a witch trial. Uh, he, Abraxas didn't seem that much more powerful than any other demon they fought. I don't think he was more powerful. I think it was that he had the ability to do this like backwards spell erase thing mm. so it's not that he was more powerful it's that he had a specific ability that they had to fight so is this like the cruciatum but for witches that's exactly what this episode is also it's like the witch trial like because it's a pun because mm. like witch trials but it's actually like a series of trials that they must go through which is actually why it bothers me that the spanish episode calls this episode witch hunt yeah that doesn't make so much sense yeah other other countries that don't have the maybe it's a pun in Spanish maybe I'm mean, other countries that don't have the English pun just call it different things like Abraxas or that time that they all had to fight a demon that stole the book I mean I, I get it it's a whole double meaning thing but there's an actual witch trial in the next episode I know when I saw the episode witch trial I was like oh yay wait no that episode's called morality bites which is such a terrible name it is a terrible name for an amazing episode. Hey kids, who remembers the movie Reality Bites? Uh, let's finish up this episode. <laughs> yes, so the sisters are all holding hands and like, Yay, we saved the book and uh, we're all glad that we're witches, even Prue. And Prue's not sad that Andy's dead anymore. She's wearing pink now. She's wearing pink now. I mean, she was wearing neon green at the beginning of the episode, but then she did her like morning outfits. And they're making Piper clean the... <laughs> <laughs> the uh chalk the chalk quatre yes they're making her clean it off the attic wall but they've got a surprise they open they, they they took out another mortgage on the house to get the money to open the club yeah is they, that, they is that a, what happened they took yeah they took out a home equity loan on the house that somehow piper didn't have to sign off on even though she's almost certainly entitled <laughs> they, they just forged her signature 
Possibly. Anyway, now they have they have the sixty thousand dollars for her so that she can buy the club, and now they're all going to be partners in the club. Oh, that's going to go well. Yeah. What's the saying again? It's it's always great to do business with friends and family. Oh yeah, it always works out. So, Piper does a kind of dead-eyed laugh when they're like, I hope you don't mind being in business with your sisters, and Piper's like, ha. Ah. Yeah. Which, I don't know if it was intentional, but... Anyway, this group hug is interrupted by Grams, who shows up. Yep, yeah, Grams goes to- is looking good, by the way. Yes, well, I think she realized that this was going to be she's going to be a permanent addition or a semi-permanent addition to the show a permanent reoccurring guest star so she wanted them to uh have a good look for her which she does not keep (laughs) they she changes her hair and clothes a lot in the afterlife she does and her also she gets older and her weight fluctuates a bit She's a ghost. She can do whatever she wants. Yeah. This is where we learn that it has been Grams turning the book to different pages. And now they have, like, reached the level of witch where they can see her ghost. Like, they leveled up, and now they have the ability to see ghosts. Yes. Certain ghosts. Certain ghosts. They could always see John Cho. Well, and they still can't see Patty. That's true. Also, Grams is like, remember, I'm always here, but sometimes I won't feel like actually showing up, so I'll just do that thing where I invisibly turn the pages. Then she turns the page and disappears, and they go look at the page, and it says, Happy Anniversary. My and, darlings. And then we do, like, a freeze frame laugh, and then credits. All right. So, it wasn't a terrible episode. It was fine. I, I, I think it's... It was a fine episode. I think that taken on its own, it would be better than what it is, which is Brad Kern's mission statement of reading season one backwards and undoing anything interesting that Constance and Burge had tried to put into the show. Yeah, it's... The thing is, I feel like this is supposed to be a table-setting episode, but it's not a very good one, because it's laying in the new normals. P3 is established. Neighbor Dan is established. Neighbor Jenny is established. And it's very brief, but Daryl sets up their new dynamic. He's like, don't tell me what you're up to, but I will serve a non-romantic version of Andy's role. In our previous in our previous podcast, Welcome to Storybrook, we talk about how season seven of Once Upon a Time is really like a soft reboot. Yeah. It's like a soft reboot of what once upon a time is this is like a soft soft reboot we're re-establishing here's who the love interest is going to be here's how the relationship with the police is going to go here's what wiccans are in this universe it's like a soft soft reboot Mm. yeah i guess it kind of parallels the witches we see in the first episode who have who are wiccans who have actual powers right are actually being hunted by not demons but warlocks because that was going to be a thing in the first season I feel like we, on and off, still get warlocks later. I mean, it, but demons are a bigger deal than warlocks. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, demons stop being a thing in like demon. We've talked about this so much before, but demons stop being a thing that you have to put makeup on to be. At right, a you're just point. a human. <laughs> you're just a human-looking person who wears black. Yeah. You don't care. You don't want. You're not watching the show for people in monster makeup. No, some people are watching the show for, like, the soap opera dynamics, and some people are watching the show to see uh, the leads in cheesecakey costumes in later seasons. Is Miss Hellfire in this season? Because... Yes. I know it's not. I know they've done it... They've they've done it-ish before, and they'll do it a lot more later. I don't know if it comes up before that, but I feel like Mrs. Hell... Ms. Hellfire, I'm sorry. I feel like Ms. Hellfire is sort of the first... Uh, costume-y you know turned into something thing it's the first turned into something costume ish thing and it's I know it's not really one it's Prugo's undercover as an assassin who wears a weird leather outfit with like a boob hole and like micro panties or whatever wait is that the first what about the time in season one when phoebe took the job at the hotel and wore the i dream of genie outfit yes 
Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, you know what? Because I was like, it feels like this is the first time where this show is being, like, overtly fetishy with the leather assassin thing, which you would think an assassin wouldn't wear an outfit that screams assassin. I'm an assassin? Yeah. Oh, what are you gonna do? <laughs> but, yeah, honestly, there's a bunch of episodes I'm looking forward to, mostly next week's Morality Bites. Yeah, well, let's do things a little out of order and talk about next week's episode. All right. I think Morality Bites is the high point of the entire series, so it's a little awkward that it's coming so soon. Yes. But, yes, next time's episode is Morality Bites, and the Netflix description is, Phoebe has a vivid premonition foretelling her own death, burned at the stake for killing a man with her powers, in the distant year of 2009. Oh, dear. Yeah. Let's see how accurate it is to 2009. We'll be listening for, uh, oh God, what was big? Was Kesha big? Was that a Kesha year? Maybe. Yes, I think it was. You know, Bojack Horseman did a really good job just, capturing the just... Yeah, just like right, right in that sweet spot of this is what the, this is what the 2000s were like. Yeah, I think it was 2007 in that, but like, it was pitch perfect these are the cultural markers of a very specific time period. Yeah. Which I feel like is hard to do the closer it gets to being that time period. But uh, yeah, so, but this is, Morality Bites is one of the stronger episodes they ever did. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that one. So we should do our segments. Yes. All right. So let's tap into our own power of three. Ooh. That is to say power of one, I guess. <laughs> right? But let's look at the first power in our pack, Premonition, where we gaze into the past and or future and see which actor in this episode is, was, or will become famous. And uh, I've got a few things for neighbor Dan, whose name I don't know. Okay. A, he's married to Angie Harmon. Uh, B, you might recognize him from having brief, a very uh, brief role in the short-lived mortal Kombat show oh my yeah where he was a one-off bad guy who got killed all right but that that is the big thing he was in he was also a soap opera star to the vast surprise of nobody yeah they, there's a lot of crossover i feel like between genre shows and soap operas yeah uh my premonition is rob the loan officer mm -hmm. yeah he was played by an actor named greg Cromer, who is has significant guest starring roles in so many tv shows so there's a likelihood that you will know him from something but he has been a significant guest star in both my favorite sitcom and max's favorite sitcom i think that's probably your favorite sitcom yeah probably in community he is dr rich in the po jeff's rival in the pottery episode oh oh and in happy endings which is the aforementioned favorite sitcom yes of you. M mine is yeah. Community. Yours is Happy Endings. Yes. Uh, yeah, in Happy Endings, he is uh, one of Penny's one-off boyfriends who is un who with the unfortunate name of Doug Hitler. Oh, my God. He's from the Penny Hearts Hitler episode. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That episode lands differently today. It does. It does. When, uh... When he thinks she's one of the those Hitler enthusiasts. You know. Yeah, yeah. He, he thinks that she's just dating him because she's fetishizing his name, when in fact she's trying really hard to figure out if that name is a deal breaker or not. Yeah, she writes it all over. She, she does, like, the middle school girl thing where she writes it over and over again. She, where and she, like, like, writes it with her, her first name with that last name. Yeah, and she also does it with her with her last name, which is Hearts. Yeah. So it just says Penny Hearts Hitler. <laughs> I also feel like it hits differently because in in 2009, right, when that show's airing, making the argument that was that's my family name, I'm not going to change it lands differently. I I'm like you can't. It's too it's 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 tar you can't. You can't be Doug Hitler anymore. Yeah. All right, so we should go to the next power in our pack, time freeze. What specifically dates this episode for you? I have a super specific one. Do yours first. Okay. Mine's also pretty specific. Uh, it's the braids in Phoebe's hair. 
Oh my god. Well, as I said, those are like the weird mini braids that I did when I was 12 and was trying to like experiment with my hair. Yeah, I don't know if it's just because I was coming of age at around that time but no i think they're very time period specific yes i I associate them very deeply with the late very late 90s very early 2000s uh so adam x the extreme had them oh my goodness (laughs) so people who've listened to a lot of our podcasts might know that in my day job i do uh title insurance for real estate Mm mm-hmm and the thing that really hit me is very early 2000s was the way that they were just able to get a load by presumably forging Piper's signature. Listen, in that time, loans were going like hot and heavy, super fast, and like money was cheap and they were just like spitting them all out. And then we had the foreclosure crisis and we found out all these documents were forged and there were bunch of laws put in place to kind of prevent what happens at the end of this episode from happening again which is just approving these loans when obviously piper didn't sign off on it they probably just like sped it through and didn't even really look at the deed and see that piper wasn't signing off on the loan anyway sorry i'm getting really on a thing here because it turned out to really crash the industry (laughs) but yeah very time period specific and uh, I think that'll take us to the last power in our pack, telekinesis. What, if anything, genuinely moved you this episode? Uh, so I was genuinely upset in the moment where the customer at Buckland's was talking about losing her husband in the accident. Like, I w- it's funny because Prue talks about it so much, but that, that guest actress, who I don't even think got a name, I don't think that character even got a name, but her talking about losing her husband in the accident really, like hit close to home for me okay so i don't think this landed at all and i wouldn't say it like moved me so much but honestly i really liked seeing grams at the end of the episode it was nice and i feel like the narrative kind of underserved the whole this is on a one-year anniversary trial of them as witches i feel like that should have been better integrated into the plot Mm-hmm. Because as is, it just is like, oh, here's a random demon who's undoing spells, but not in a way that affects them outside of them having to fight a few demons they've already fought. Also, it's like super easy because they just remember what they said and say it again. Yeah, like, it's not a good trial, but I did really like seeing Grams. And for all of the jokes we make about Grams, you know, not staying dead for more than a few episodes at a time, I think she's a really strong part of the show. I mean, and there's a reason she doesn't stay dead. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they bring her back. I, I do also like that she's wearing the, like, swoopy arm dress that she wore when she was fighting uh, the Shadow. Yes. Which is definitely not what she died in. I think she just, she's, she's like... She's got an extensive wardrobe in heaven. I'm coming back in my most iconic look. I mean, we all should do the same. But uh, that'll about do it, though. Yeah, I guess that's it for this week. This show is partially listener-supported. If you want to be one of our supporters, you should head over to our website, www.welcometotelevision.net, and click on our Patreon link. We'd like to thank our current $5 and above patrons, Beryl, Patricia, Sam, Cassidy, Alex, Alicia, Ryan, Maracruz, Rosa, Javier, Benjamin, Kyle, and Kate. If you'd like to support the show in other ways, you can always rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. If you want to talk about this episode, or any episode, or any episode of any television show, you should join our Facebook group, Welcome to Television. We can also be contacted at I Love TV Zines on Twitter or at I Love Television Zines at gmail.com. So until next time, I'm Tina. And I'm Max. And this has been Welcome to the Hallowell Manor.